Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for uh, giving me the opportunity to present our results in this meeting uh, or in this session about novel biomarkers in neurodegenerative diseases. Our current knowledge about prevalent neurodegenerative diseases has drastically increased in the last two decades, and this has been mainly due to a successful combination between uh, basic neuroscience research, clinical findings derived from uh, multicenter studies, and the use of cutting-edge technologies uh, to search for reliable biomarkers in preclinical population. One of the best examples of this fruitful collaboration has been the, our current knowledge about uh, brain changes occurring in the years preceding the first clinical symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And this knowledge, and this knowledge has led us to a very detailed map of the natural course of Alzheimer's disease, putting more emphasis on uh, asymptomatic and prodromal stages, uh, and providing a framework to, uh, to integrate in how the cascade of neurodegeneration relates to morphological changes in neurons, synaptic dysfunctions that finally lead to macroscopic brain changes and functional deficits in connectivity typically observed in MCI and clinical stages of Alzheimer's disease. A novel framework has been recently proposed in the field of preclinical Alzheimer's disease. In this framework, neuropathological changes start to appear years preceding the first cognitive and behavioral deficits in asymptomatic subjects. And in, in fact, uh, this has led, or this has challenged the use of imaging and biomarkers uh, in liquid to detect AD pathology uh, at very early stages of disease. And in this scenario, it has been suggested that uh, PET amyloid imaging uh, um, liquid biomarkers are more effective to detect changes in AD pathology in asymptomatic stages of disease, whereas uh, structural uh, imaging biomarkers like atrophies of medial temporal lobe or cortical thinnings are more appropriate to track disease progression in prodromal and clinical stages of Alzheimer's disease. In the next, I will focus on how different uh, brain and behavioral systems are affected in MCI subjects. First, I will show you some correlates, hippocampal correlates of episodic memory deficits in this population. Next, I will present some data uh, supporting damage of structural cortical networks in uh, MCI. Uh, I will also present uh, results about uh, structural changes in the basal forebrain of NCI subjects. And finally, I will present some recent evidence uh, supporting the link between amyloid concentration, sleep deficits, and cortical thinning in amnestic MCI. Evidence from post-mortem studies suggest that first a deletion occur in the, uh, or appear in the uh, entorhinal cortex and the CA1 layer of hippocampus, that both regions are strongly involved in the formation and consolidation of episodic memories, and you know are strongly impaired in, in Alzheimer's disease. And we also know that these two regions, uh, entorhinal and CA1, um, are the main exit gateway from, from the hippocampal formation of information, from the hippocampal formation to neocortical networks for memory consolidation. And we have recently found that these two regions are significantly atrophied in amnestic MCI subjects. So to evaluate if there is a relationship between damage of these two structural regions and uh, episodic memory deficits in amnestic MCI, we have been using a cognitive paradigm in the lab with young adults, uh, healthy elderly subjects, and amnestic MCI. 
In this, uh, in this cognitive task, we first presented faces of famous people preceded by a biographical cue that was related or not with the face that we uh, presented before. And the face was presented in a, randomly presented in a different quadrant of the screen, and we asked the participant to press a different button to indicate if the face was related, semantically related, or not related with the biographical cue. So here we have two examples of trials. On the left, you have the face of Fernando Alonso preceded by Formula One, that would be a congruent trial. And on the right, you have the face of uh, Antonio Banderas uh, preceded by the name of Julio Iglesias, that would be an incongruent trial. So by using this cognitive paradigm, we were able to evaluate the effect of previous semantic knowledge on hippocampal dependent episodic memory performance. So in one hour later, in the memory task, we present the same faces as before, that part of them were presented in the same quadrant of the screen or in a different location. And we asked the participants to press a button as quickly and accurate as possible to indicate if the face was presented in the same or a different location. So we first found that uh, the semantic congruence that's to say the uh, association between the face and the uh, congruent biographical cue improve associative memory in young adults and healthy elderly subjects. And this memory benefit was significantly correlated with the spectral power of theta oscillation in parahippocampal regions, supporting the role of hippocampal oscillation in episodic memory at least in these two populations, in uh, young and older adults. However, um, MCI subjects didn't obtain benefit from semantic congruence in the associative, me in, uh, in the associative memory task. But when we divided the uh, MCI subjects in uh, carriers and non-carriers of the APOE4 genotype, we found that only those who were non-carrier of the APOE4 genotype obtained benefits from semantic congruence in the associative memory task. We also showed that uh, the different relationship between episodic memory benefits and the integrity of the uh, structural uh, uh, of the structural integrity in the uh, in the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampal layers allowed us to differentiate between both groups, healthy elderly subjects and amnestic MCI, supporting the role of um, these two structures in episodic memory deficits in, in this population as well. Damage of structural cortical networks can be also detected in older adults at risk to develop Alzheimer's disease with sub-millimeter precision and using neuroimaging analysis techniques. Here we have the result of comparing pattern of cortical thickness between healthy elderly subjects and amnestic MCI, 100 participants in each group, and cortical thinning, as you can see cortical thinning uh, in amnestic MCI was limited to regions that are affected by early neuropathology in AD postmortem studies, like for instance, mentorhinal cortex, parahippocampal regions, and temporal gyrus bilaterally. When we divided the MCI subjects into uh, APOE for carriers and non carriers, we found that thinning of the cingulate cortex in different regions of the cingulate cortex allowed us to differentiate between the two groups. Uh, for instance, in the case of APOE4 carriers, we found that atrophic of the cortical, uh, of the cingulate cortex was moved to the most posterior part of these regions and restricted to the right cortical hemisphere, whereas in the case of the APOE4 non-carriers, we found that atrophies were more anterior and limited to the left cortical hemisphere. And this result suggests that a different pathway for neurodegeneration within the cingulate cortex might be underlying MCI subjects depending on this genotype. 
Evidence also suggests that uh, the basal forebrain cholinergic system is affected in Alzheimer's disease. And this has been confirmed with immunohistochemistry experiments showing, showing significant cholinergic denervation in cortical regions uh, affected by AD pathology, and also with PET imaging uh, revealing a significant uh, decrease of acetylcholinesterase activity in AD regions affected in this type of population. However, there are few in vivo studies showing structural uh, uh, changes in the basal forebrain in amnestic MCI patients. So by using a probabilistic atlas of the basal forebrain, uh, of the different basal forebrain cholinergic compartments obtained from postmortem human brain, we were able to compare volume changes in each uh, uh, cholinergic compartment of uh, between uh, healthy elderly subjects and amnestic MCI. Mm. I'm going to explain a little bit in this figure. In blue, you have the entire basal forebrain, and the yellow and orange spots uh, reveal the significant changes, volume changes, in uh, amnestic MCI patients when compared with healthy elderly subjects. All these changes were found in the CH4 nucleus that corresponds to the nucleus basalis of Mainer, uh, where are most of the cholinergic neurons innervating the neocortex in the human brain. Uh, these changes in the uh, nucleus basalis uh, were significantly correlated with other cortical regions, atrophies of other cortical regions that are affected in AD process. Like, for instance, the temporal lobe, the superior parietal cortex, or the uh, uh, prefrontal cortex. And also, we found that uh, volume changes in the nucleus basalis account for a cognitive impairment only in amnestic MCI, not in control. So, these results together suggest that the basal cholinergic, uh, basal forebrain cholinergic system is also fed in amnestic MCI subjects, and this might be used as an in vivo marker of disease progression in this population. Um, sleep disorders are one of the, mo of the main troubling symptoms in Alzheimer's disease, and in fact, different, different studies have identified a link between amyloid concentration and sleep deficits, but in animals. Uh, for instance, Kang and collaborators showed that uh, an increased amylo amyloid load in uh, regions affected by Alzheimer's disease precede uh, sleep, uh, pre uh, was followed by a chronic sleep restriction. But more interestingly, the same research group found that sleep deficits appear just after the first amyloid deposition occur in the brain of PS1, uh, APP PS1 mice. So these animals showed more wake, less REM sleep, and less mm, slow wave sleep with amyloid deposition. So in general, these studies are suggesting that there is, uh, that there is a relationship between amyloid deposition and sleep deficits, and this relationship might emerge uh, at very early stages of disease. So uh, to test this hypothesis in humans, and more specifically in uh, amnestic MCI, we decide to record physiological sleep and to measure alpha beta levels in plasma in uh, MCI population. And we found that MCI subjects showed a significantly decreased REM sleep together with uh, more fragmented slow wave sleep and also increased alpha beta levels in uh, beta, uh, alpha beta 40 and 42. And we also found that a significant association between the amount of slow wave sleep fragmentation and the increased levels of alpha beta 42, but only in amnestic MCI subjects. We also wanted to investigate if these sleep deficits are uh, correlated with uh, the uh, cortical integrity in MCI subjects. And we found that REM deficits 
were significantly correlated with uh, the thinning of postcentral uh, gyrus and the cortical atrophies in the posterior cingulate cortex and the superior parietal cortex. The later two regions are highly vulnerable to amyloid deposition in different stages of disease. So, in general, these results are suggesting that we might extend the link between amyloid deposition or concentration and sleep deficit to humans, to early stages of disease, and uh, also we provide evidence to link this result to uh, the cortical integrity of this population. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. We have time for one or two questions. A very nice, a very nice talk. Just when you were doing the basal forebrain uh, volumetric analysis for the cholinergic areas, I mean, obviously the the area that you chose overlaps with quite a lot of other structures, such as the nucleus accumbens. Uh, and the dorsal amygdala. How did you make sure that the volume changes were actually specific to the CH4 uh, and not any of those areas? We, we used for this study a probabilistic atlas of, the, uh, of different nucleus of the basal forebrain and we decide on a threshold to, de to decide the significance in each nucleus. For that reason, was a probabilistic atlas. We decide that 80% of postmortem human brains have to be uh, have to be the CH4 in our uh, changes obtained in our study. So 80% of uh, the postmortem samples uh, were matched our result in our study. Have you analyzed the hypothalamus in the, in the study you were, you were looking at the sleep disorders because the hypothalamus is the main site for sleep regulation? No, we didn't do that analysis uh, in this study. I have one question. So it seems that the sleep disorders in the Alzheimer's disease, sleep is deteriorated quite early, like during the preclinical phase of Alzheimer's disease. So how important do you think this will be for clinical detection of Alzheimer's disease? Okay. That would be an early marker, but together with other markers of disease, because you know in aging, uh, sleep disorders uh, is also affected, so you have to discriminate very well between early neurodegeneration and normal aging before uh, before um, taking this conclusion. So uh, you not uh, sleep by itself can be used for anything, but in combination with other markers of disease, of Alzheimer's disease might be more uh, very useful. <coughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. We will move to the next.